Hundreds of PNG power workers stage a sit-in protest over entitlements. Governor Nauru urged to honor commitments for road projects. And the 2015 baton is set to tour the country in the lead up to the games. This is National MTV News with Tokana Hasavi. Good evening and thank you for joining me. This is Monday's News. We begin tonight's bulletin with a special report. About 150 lay-based PNG power workers held a sit-in strike today at the company's engineering yard over outstanding entitlements owed to them by the state. It follows previous strikes held in the past several months that came after announcements that key assets of PNG Power Limited will be sold off to a private company. PNG Power workers have reassured the lay public that electricity will continue to flow unless there is a technical fault that causes blackouts. NTV's Bethany Harriman with this special report from Lay. PNG Power workers in revenue generating centers in Lay, Port Moresby, Yonki, and Mount Hagen have held a sit in strike today. Our 17.7% .7 has to be paid, and on top of that, all our entitlements must be paid before we return to work. And that is our stand. Yeah. Anything to do with private association and private gift block government and company block all, they have the right to private us. Most of them have worked for the state-owned enterprise for over 20 years, and they want their entitlements before a company takes over certain key PNG power assets. So I must come and talk to them face to face. The workers say before key assets of the state-owned entity are bought by another company, they must be paid their entitlements. They have called for a decision to be made by the state enterprise minister, Ben Maika, because the PPL management have been asked not to interfere with PNG Power's operations during the induced state of emergency. And we are with the boys in Yonki. Over the last 10 years, PNG Power has struggled financially. Its management asked to increase tariff, but it was turned down by the NEC. Instead, a state of emergency was imposed by State Enterprise Minister Ben Maika so that he can directly handle the financial affairs of PPL that include recouping outstanding payments of bills. Workers have called for a report showing just how much money has been recovered and if some of the money can be used to pay their entitlements. Though frustrated over long delays to their payments, lay-based PNG power workers today assured the lay community that electricity will flow normally throughout the city. Technical faults will be the only cause for blackouts. They have also called for support from the wider community as they demand for their payments. It follows the government's decision to sell assets that include power stations in Lei and hydro facilities that are PNG Power's nerve cell in Yonki. This isn't the first strike that has happened. Over the years, workers have staged strikes over political meddling and interferences in the affairs of a company that, despite challenges, continued to provide an essential service. Oh, all about Germany, we will some stuff. The workers and the union are working together to have the matter resolved after several months of debating the issue with PNG Power's management. Though essential workflow hasn't been affected, the workers on strike are waiting for directives from the union president. We will not be moved unless we get what is rightfully ours. In September last year, the issue of the outstanding entitlements caused workers on strike, demanding a response from management. A circular also passed out by PBL's management in September 2014 didn't give specifics to when the payments will be made. Workers said that it was a slap in the face. It's not the first time and they'd expected more than just a note. Today, they are holding the sit-in strike, demanding payment for the same outstanding entitlements that caused the strike on September last year. Bethany Harriman, National MTV News, Lei. 
Meanwhile, Public Enterprise and State Investments Minister Ben Micah has urged PNG Power workers to wait for government's decision to restructure the organization. Minister Micah said this week he will present to Cabinet a submission on the restructure of PNG Power. He said the intention is to outsource the generation area to allow for more efficient and reliable electricity services for the public. The submission will also address the outstanding claims for workers and funding to pay off workers who are to be retrenched under the restructure. Minister Micah said Cabinet will discuss proposed changes to PNG Power, which will provide answers for workers' grievances and concerns. The preliminary design for the relocation of the Mendy Airport to its new location has been completed. From its current location at the centre of Mendy, the airport will be moved 9 kilometres to the south in Lower Mendy in Southern Highlands. This project is one development nominated as high-impact projects during the LNG umbrella benefit sharing agreement between the state and landowners. A feasibility study conducted by Cardinal covered details of the project design, airport planning and engineering cost estimation for the project. The preliminary report was presented to Works and Implementation Minister and Member for Imbongo Francis Awesa in Port Mosby today. The feasibility study was co-funded by the Imbongo District and the Southern Highlands Provincial Government. Minister Awesa, when receiving the report, stated that the relocation aims to address two important issues. That knows uh, about, the, about the about four years to complete the study, which cost uh, 2.5 million. Current airport occupies uh, a large area of land uh, in the middle of town, which which uh, which could be uh, freed up for commercial development. A uh, major consideration is that over the last uh, few years, there have been very, very uh, major uh, accidents uh, because the airport sits in the middle of two uh, big, uh, big uh, uh, mountains. He said the relocation of the airport from the capital of Southern Highlands is also to allow for future developments. Consultations were made between Cardinal PNG Limited the Civil Aviation Authority and the National Airports Corporation for advice on technical, compliance and statutory requirements. We have a site which is five kilometers to the south of the capital of Mindy um, in a larger valley um, with better approaches and better um, aviation characteristics. The next phase of this project is for assessment on all other elements, including design review, site planning and land acquisition. Expressions of interest are now called from the industry to complete the next phase. This project was approved by the Southern Islands Provincial Executive Council as a high-impact project under the PNG LNG UBSA agreement. Michelle Amba, National MTV News. Deputy Opposition Leader and Pangu Party Leader Sam Basil says he will be working closely with various political parties which he described as marginalised to form the next government. Mr Basil says in this government almost 17% of the current members of parliament have been implicated for criminal and leadership cases to answer for. This he says questions the integrity of political parties and coalition in this government. The deputy opposition leader, who is the political head for Pangu Party, says this ninth parliament has seen some political leaders and MPs implicated with pending cases, while some have already served time for their crimes. He said having political parties in the opposition should not be seen as a hindrance to service delivery. Mr. Basil says he will work with marginalized coalition partners of the current regime to lobby into the 2017 national elections. Party will will join hands with um, the party, um, the National Alliance Party, the PNG Party, PLP, and other good parties that are being marginalised in the backbench of government of the day. We will work closely with them, and we will ensure that and should the opportunity present itself, we will ensure a new government before 2017 elections. Yesterday, Pangu Party announced its candidate for the Pomio by election, Leo Katal.
party leader Basil emphasized that although they will be disadvantaged in terms of funding, it will not stop them from forming a government that will uphold its party integrity and deliver much-needed services. Meanwhile, attempts to get comments from the Prime Minister Peter O'Neill have been unsuccessful as he is currently out of the country. Bridget Komatep, National MTV News. And National MTV News continues with more local stories coming up after the break. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. Bulol MP Sam Basil has called on Morabe Governor Kelly Naru and his provincial administration to honour their commitment of 3 million kina for the Garina Road construction project. Mr Basil made this call when inspecting the road project sites last week. The Garina Road is a vital link for the inland people of Bulolo district, which will pave the way for government services and supplies into the remote villages. This is the new Garina Road project in Bulolo, Morobe province. Once completed, it will connect the people of Biaru, Kasangare and Garina Station to Wau Bulolo and Lei City. And that cut will go up and link the Owen Stanley Range and link Kunimaipa. And once we reach Kunimaipa, People can drive to Port Mosby. They are still waiting for the 3 million Kina PSIP fund committed by the Morobe Provincial Government through the Governor Kelly Naru during the Bulolo Councillor's Summit last year. Bulolo District is also counterfunding the project with 2 million Kina. We have spent uh, money last year to purchase machines. We got a 20 ton excavator, uh, a 10 ton bulldozer, uh, two 6 ton trucks, and we are increasing the fleet this year. We're putting two more uh, four by four dump trucks. Uh, we also may be putting another 20 ton excavator to make sure that the team uh, uh, progresses uh, effectively. The only access into Biaru, Kasangare, and Garina station is by air. The road conditions have become worse, forcing the people to walk for several hours to get to the government station. Sam Basil also blamed the Morobe Provincial Administration for awarding contracts to the cronies paper contractors who get paid for doing no tangible developments. The contractors come in and they don't really finish the job. They just do a few kilometers and then they collect one, two, three million, five hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand, 500,000, 700,000 and they disappear. Now I MP Gisuat Sinuin made the same call for the governor to honor his commitments. He wants the governor and the administration to release his three million Kina PSIP funds for road projects in Nawai district. Sylvester Gawi, National MTV News, Lei. The Nawai district administration has spent almost a million kina on paying outstanding bills for higher cars in previous years. Nawai MP Gisuat Sinuin made this known when delivering six new vehicles for his district last week. He also called on other districts in Papua New Guinea to purchase their own vehicles and should not waste money on hiring vehicles. MTV's Silva Sagawi once again has this report. Nawai District is a coffee producing district in Papua New Guinea. However, poor government services in previous years have left the district and its people to suffer. Sinuin is a transparent man. Local MP Gisuat Sinuin, a retired teacher who has been in the public service for decades, described his district as one of the neglected ones in Papua New Guinea. Now the district is looking at restoring accountability in spending government funds. This is to ensure funds are fully used to save the people. At the end of last year, I told them, please, so much has been spent. We should, we should buy it at least the same amount, same thing like that, but we spend on beer cost only. So around 900,000, around there. The amount of money spent on hiring one vehicle for a year is about 250,000 kina. The same cost as paying for two brand new vehicles. In almost every district in Papua New Guinea, about a million kina is spent on hiring vehicles. That money is a much needed funding for road and bridge infrastructure or a new education and health facility in remote areas. Hire a car. Some of us are just getting our one talks to hire a car and we give the money back. That's not on. That's not on. So other districts, now me buy a car, now I, yeah. buy all man, blow me buy all, all public service, by work, yeah. Now by money by stop in a long district, long make him work, long bring him service to long people. Like what? In one reported instance, local MPs and administrations colluded with higher car companies and land vehicles 
at a cost of 800 to 1,000 kina per day. Sylvester Gawi, National MTV News, Lay. Villages from Kapari and Viriolo in the Abao district of Central Province are now privileged to access basic banking services in their respective villages hundreds of kilometres away from the city. A dedicated team from Westpac Retail Banking, Port Moresby, has introduced a service designed specifically for rural areas. Tagged as the in-store banking system, villages are allowed to do basic banking transactions like withdrawing and depositing money in their accounts using an FPOS machine. Westpac's Everywhere Banking Team leader, Rafael Wayalaka, says the in-store banking system is an initiative designed to cater for people in rural areas, to not only give them access to money, but also to encourage them to save money. We had a good number of teams visit here and they opened accounts, many accounts, and I would estimate around about within the vicinity of 500 uh, card holders, account holders in, in this community. And, and this community is not only the Kapari and Viriolo community, but we've got people from the from the inlands coming. The, the people who have bought blocks, who live in blocks, uh, rubber rubber plantations, and they come. And even people who are in the inlands who come to sell food here. People from Viriolo and other nearby villages in Abao also travel to Kapari to use the service, which was set up at a local trade store in February. The locals have embraced the in-store banking system, which in the past would have cost them a 20 kina PMV fare and travelling for four hours into town to do. A team of Westpac officers travelled to Kapari over the weekend to meet locals at the Saturday morning market and assist them with opening banking accounts and register on mobile banking so that they can easily perform banking transactions at convenience. Uh, many of the community members who reside in this place do not have opportunity access to moving into the city and doing banking and doing other necessary things, especially to cash and banking. Uh, Westpac coming into our community is like a great blessing to us because it has blessed us one way or the other. From means of security and our travel in and out, it's so convenient today. Westpac established the in-store banking system in 2013 through its Everywhere Banking program and to date has 48 merchants operating throughout the country. Vanessa Knight, National MTV News. There is slow but steady progress with developments at the Modilon General Hospital. Some of its key facilities, such as the operating theatre, are seeing improvements. The new operating theatre will be completed this year. After years of dealing with its own in-house issues, Modilon General Hospital has finally buried its past and moved on. Developments are progressing at a steady rate. Workmen have been on a tight schedule to deliver the new theatre in time. The new theatre will replace the old one. It will have four operating rooms, unlike the old one which has only two. It is designed and funded by the Cabrini Hospital in Melbourne. CEO Christian Gowie says the theatre will be the vantage point for any further developments. Other developments include the extension of the waiting area for a children's ward and a TB clinic. Ms. Gowie says the hospital has received a tremendous support from all its partners to see change happen. It has helped to cushion the financial challenges faced by the hospital. Excellent work ethic and commitment from staff has seen an improvement in patient care. The Interplast teams have also been carrying out operations at the hospital. Mickey Cavera, National MTV News. Schools around the country are being encouraged to utilize emergency kits being supplied to them by the Education Department and UNICEF. Education Secretary Dr. Michael Tapo said last week that the purpose of the emergency supply kits are to help support students and their families and must be used correctly whenever a natural disaster strikes. Schools in 13 provinces have received their share of the emergency supplies containing school-in-a-box kits, school-in-a-tent kits, emergency family kits and the non-food item kits. 
Dr. Tapos says natural disasters happen unexpectedly and should a disaster strike a particular area, schools will now be in a better position to support their students. This can become the thing for the future for provinces that are always uh, struck with disaster because these are ready, they are packed and they are very tidy and they can actually be ship or be aeroplane or helicopter or going by speedboat to that area and be given to the community that are always affected by the disaster. He says in the past schools wait for the government for assistance. However, today they are fully equipped with items that can support them while they wait for further assistance. He strongly discourages the misuse of kits such as the school in a box and school in a tent as they were manufactured purposely for emergencies and cannot last long if used for a longer period of time. Um, some of these uh, school in the, in the box and some of these uh, kids, uh, blankets and all those things have been used for other purposes like a uh, house cry and all that. Now that is wrong. These things are meant for our children and their families during disaster. Now it cannot be used for, uh, for when people die in house cry. Uh, it is wrong because these are meant for school purposes. The secretary has also appealed to the provinces to provide reports so that the education department and UNICEF can be updated about the delivery and usage of these kids. When the kids have been delivered, it is only fair for people to report back to, to the Department of Education. Uh, they can, if you know UNICEF office, you can communicate directly in Port Mosby, but if you like, you uh, you communicate directly to the Secretary for Education in the Department and we will look at the, the uh, uh, reports that are coming from the provinces and likewise we will respond back to you to find out what uh, can be done. Dr. Tapo concluded that the other remaining provinces will be receiving their supplies very soon. Ivan Kambibel, National MTV News. The 15th Correctional Service Commanders and Senior Management Conference was held last Friday in Keravat, East New Britain Province. It is an annual event where officers refine their yearly work plan and challenges encountered. MTV's Fasinatiyama has more on this report. Significance in what we set out to do. This year's conference was based on the theme, The Success in PNGCS is Driven by the Power of Unity. It is an important event in the CS calendar. CS Minister Jim Simatab was present to officially open the meeting. The valued partnerships with provincial administra administrations and governors that I alluded to earlier also depend on the commander's personal abilities to become proactive in forging relationships and promote understanding by others of our work. Commanders were told to manage the jails to a higher expectation and be proactive in establishing relationship with stakeholders. One of the agendas discussed was the CS rehabilitation program and the policy on institutional reforms. The reform is aimed at enhancing efficiency and improvement of roles in law and justice sector. The discussion were also about the review of the national prison system and the PNGCS institutional structure and the legislation framework. It is crucial for the modernization of CS in terms of its powers, functions and practices and how they engage others in the delivery of their services. Plans and procedures were also set to reduce 23 million kina debts from years 2012 and 13. A prison service charter was also presented. It is a survey on the topic dealing with dilemmas and difficult people. Detainees' views were also collected. It's becoming an effective organization. How you deliver services, how would you treat people, and people expect you to treat them. So it's about obligations, responsibilities, but not, not the intelligence. A total of 20 commanding officers and members of the CS executive team, including the CS Commissioner Michael Waipo, attended the two days event. Fasinata Yama, National MTV News. 
The NAS Fund Contributors Savings and Loans, or NCSL, posted a 6.5 million kina profit for the 2014 year. NCSL Board approved an interest crediting rate of 5.5% to be paid to members' accounts for the 2014 year. Chairman Ian Turitua, Turitia rather, said investments in government-inscribed stocks, loan portfolio growth, property and share investments were the main drivers of growth and profitability. Nest Fund Contributor Savings and Loan Society Limited, or NCSL, announced 6.5 million kina profits and interest crediting rate of 5.5%. At its recent meeting, the board of NCSL heard that total assets was 123.6 million kina, over 13% increase compared to the previous year. Net asset value was 15.6 million kina, a growth of 11.3%. Net income, 6.5 million kina, an increase of over 6.5% on the 2013 audited results. Total membership grew by more than 7% to 72,355 during the year. Member savings increased from 94.1 million kina to 107.2 million kina, representing an increase of just under 14%. NCSL also recorded a payment of just under 47 million kina in withdrawals on members' savings accounts. The savings and loans granted a total of 4,000 loans with a total volume of 38.7 million kina. As a result of these outcomes, the NCSL board approved an interest crediting rate of 5.5%, equating to around 5.2 million kina to be paid to members' accounts for the 2014 financial year. Chairman Ian Tarutia said the board was pleased with the overall results of NCSL in 2014 in the face of challenges in the local economy. The main drivers of profitability and balance sheet growth were on the back of investments in government-inscribed stocks, loan portfolio growth, property and share investments. The society will have over 10 million kina in general reserves in addition to retained earnings of just under 7 million kina. The board paid 6% to members in 2013 and with the 2014 result, NCSL has paid an average of over 5.5% over the past five years. The 5.5% interest crediting announced by NCSL is in addition to the 8.5% recently announced by the Nesfan board which overall provides a very healthy 14% interest for contributors who are members of both NCSL and Nest Fund. Delhi Bagu, National MTV News. And now we check out the finance news. The Kina closed unchanged at 0.3765 US dollars in the interbank market. And at Bank South Pacific, the Kina was fetching 0.369 US dollars, 0.4710 Australian dollars, 0.337 euro and 43.97 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold and cocoa, copper, crude oil and copper all closed the day higher, while coffee closed lower and palm oil closed the day unchanged. And lastly on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 168 points higher, the ASX closed at 19 points lower and the All Ordinaries closed at 15 points lower. You're with National MTV News. We'll continue with more local stories, including international headlines, when we come back. Stay with us. Welcome back to National MTV News. Passengers travelling from Morabe and the Highlands provinces into Madang are now paying extra to travel following the collapse of bridges along the Ramu to Madang Highway. On top of the normal 60 kina bus fare charged by PNV operators, Passengers pay an extra 50 kina to carriers for transportation of their cargo from one collapsed bridge to another. Passengers using the Medang Ramu Highway are forced to pay 5 or 10 kina before they are allowed to cross each of the collapsed bridges. This means once they reach the last collapsed bridge, they would have spent about a hundred kina, depending on how many bags they are carrying or the number of children traveling with them. The experience is similar to those passengers traveling out of Medang. 
Or kalab gel or one kina mile, two kina mile car gel. Golo narba bridge gel one kind. Or transit transit tigo. Nega tol mereng bus gel salab sa last bridge number four bridge asas. On the tenth of this month, Michael Dengue, a passenger who travelled from Medang into Ramu, said the idea of villages collecting monies from passengers using the highway is unacceptable because the road link is a national highway. At the cross street, Miss Perry, 50 km now long, he come long here now because no dog tabagala, travel line long, he got no boy, buy him boy, now this line will go buy more five km, five km, that was my name. He got, uh, he got 20 MX more. The idea of villages collecting monies from the traveling public due to natural disasters like floods and landslides has become a common practice for villages living along the national highways. And now with the Ramamedang road link cut off, PMV operators and other motorists are also charged a fee of 100 kina before they are allowed to cross any of the five collapsed bridges in Medang. Takla Gunga, National MTV News, Lei. Turning overseas now, Lee Kuan Yew, founding father and first Prime Minister of Singapore, has passed away at the age of 91. Mr. Lee was Prime Minister from 1959 when Singapore gained independence from the British until 1990 when he stepped down. Late into his life, he remained the dominant personality and driving force in what he called a first world oasis in a third world region. Prime Minister for more than 30 years, towering influence on the skyscraper city-state for half a century. It is his son who rules Singapore today. What is it? I'm trying to do. I'm trying to create in a third world situation a first world oasis. Born in Singapore in 1923, Lee was fourth generation ethnic Chinese. After studying law at Cambridge University in England, he returned home and entered politics. In the 1960s, he led his small island from its status as a British colony to brief union in Malaysia to full independence. Overcoming racial tensions at home and pressures from communist insurgency and instability in its much larger neighbors, the city-state underwent a remarkable transformation from an economic backwater to one of the most developed cities in Asia. Some praised him as a visionary, others called him authoritarian. He tolerated little dissent. He was criticized for his government's tight control over the press and political activity. Human rights activists attacked the city-state's use of caning as a criminal punishment and the death penalty. Lee was unapologetic about his approach. I'm not following any prescription given me by any theoretician on democracy or whatever. I work from first principles, what will get me there? Social peace and stability within the country. No fight between the races, between religions, whatever. Fair shares for all. In 1990, Lee stepped down as Prime Minister, but didn't bow out of politics completely. He took the post of Senior Minister in the cabinet of his immediate successor, Go Chok Tong, and was given the specially created title of Minister Mentor in the government of the current Prime Minister, his own son, Lee Hsien Lung. He will be remembered as the father of modern Singapore, a titan of modern Asia, a man who made his island a thriving modern state. On a more brighter note, after hearing of Pope Francis's craving for pizza, a local eatery made a special delivery right to the pontiff's motorcade. The Pope was in the town of Naples, a troubled Italian neighborhood where he urged young people to stay out of, tr of drug deals. He may be a proud Argentinian, but that's not to say the man born Jorge Mario Bergoglio, better known today as Pope Francis, doesn't have some distinctly Italian tastes. When asked in a recent interview what he missed the most since taking on the top job in the Catholic Church, the pontiff's reply took some by surprise. The only thing I would like is to go out one day without being recognized and go to a pizzeria for a pizza, he said. Hearing of the Pope's visit to the home of Pizza, the city of Naples, one enterprising resident decided to make the Holy Father's Day. 
While I was making the pizzas for my clients, I heard the Pope's car coming, and I got ready. While his car was approaching, I jumped over the fence and I gave him the pizza, and with a smile he said thank you. As it turns out, the Pope isn't the only global icon to have savoured the delights of the family business. Pizzeria Don Ernesto. In 1994, my dad did a little pizza for American President Bill Clinton. And yesterday, when I got to know the Pope was in town, I decided to make a pizza and give it to him as a gift. Enzo's still waiting to hear whether Pope Francis enjoyed his experience. But the pizza chef certainly has a belly full of pride. It's really hard for me to understand what I managed to do. Giving a pizza you made with your own hands to the Pope is very emotional. It's really hard for me to express the value of this gesture for a man we really love and value, for a beautiful person full of humanity. And with clientele like this, perhaps Enzo can expect a heaven-sent boost to his business. And National MTV News continues with True Guy Sports. That's coming up next, and I'll give you all the details after these short messages. True Guy Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. The Old Search Games Baton Relay is set to tour the country beginning on Sunday. The launching of the relay will be held in Port Moresby on Thursday, just 100 days out from the Games. The Games relay team, led by Tamsin Wardley, will depart Sunday for sundown to begin the provincial tour. The 2015 All Search Games Relay will be officially launched here in the nation's capital on Thursday, but begins on Sunday, the 29th of March, in Vanimo in the Sundown Province. Games Relay team leader Tamsin Wardley confirmed the schedule for the 100-day event. The provinces within the Momase region will have the privilege of sighting the relay baton first, joining the festive celebrations of Papua New Guinea's sporting ability in the lead-up to the Games in July. As the baton makes its way through the country after visiting Vanimo and Wiwak, the relay team will travel to Medang before reaching the Highlands region. Their provincial visits will showcase each province's culture and tradition as the team visits provincial sites and engages in sports and community-driven activities. Lorraine Genia, National MTV Sports. Kainantu Crusaders are now the champions of the Coca-Cola Impetus Cup Northern Challenge after defeating Amara Rabbitohs in Ley yesterday afternoon. Crusaders defeated Rabbitohs 12 points to nil in a thrilling grand final match played at the Igam Army Barracks Oval. They now qualify for the Eastern and Finals playoff to be 